some assumptions, but these are some assumptions that we have. Um, we believe that we're all probably coming into this conversation from different places. Some folks have been doing this work for generations. For others, it's your first time even having this conversation, and we celebrate that, right? And the way, and the way we celebrate that is if this is like a very early conversation for you, honoring the folks who've been doing this work and might have a little bit more knowledge, and if you are the folks who've been doing this work, being generous of spirit with where everyone is in the room, right? That's how we're going to do that. Um, we acknowledge that we're going to be focusing on race, but through an inner race, but through an intersectional lens. And by intersectional, we mean we acknowledge that people's lived experience is not divided into <coughs> categories, that race is complicated by gender, is complicated by disability, is complicated by sexual orientation, etc., and that uh, the mechanisms and systems of oppression also play out that way too. However, we're going to be focused on race uh, in part because we have 90 minutes. <laughs> And there's a lot we can talk about with race, but a lot of these conversations are applicable to other areas of identity. And we think that uh, boards should always be considering those other areas of identity when we talk about diversity. We're going to be focused on board, but we're very clear that this is also about staff. This is also about artists. This is also about who is showing up in your houses. These things are not independent. They fail when they are independent, right? So we're, we're focused on board, but we're acknowledging that. We're also, an, an assumption that we have is that a lot of folks in this room may work at predominantly white theaters. We define predominantly white theaters as theaters who historically and currently have had their boards, staff, the, the work on their stages, the people in their audiences, predominantly made up of white people, and as such have benefited from systemic racism. We also know that there are some theaters of color in this room, and we're going to hear from some on our panel and that these folks have been holding down the work of developing trustees of color for generations, and there's, so, so there's some real knowledge there, and we want to honor that. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that when predominantly white theaters often do equity, diversity, and inclusion work, and TCG is a part of this, that sometimes we can take up a lot of space, and that can have really negative uh, repercussions for theaters of color, so we're going to be tracking that in this conversation as we go through. Finally, we're going to be, when we're looking at strategies for change, we're going to be looking at them from the personal level, the organizational level, the field-wide level, and then beyond, right? Change has to be moving in all four of those theaters for it to be effective. And finally, I'm up here, I'm gesturing, I'm projecting, I am not an expert. <laughs> Do not be deceived. There is as much knowledge about this in this room as there is here and on this panel. We're moving us through this conversation together. We have a little bit of things to share, but we are not experts. Also, the work doesn't end, right? There's no one who's like, check mark, diverse board. That doesn't happen. Right? If that happens, you know there's trouble, OK? The work continues. We are always asking who is missing. We are always checking in with the experience of everyone on the board and asking, are we being inclusive? Are we being equitable? Okay, so we're going to be moving through an agenda that is already slightly behind. Goals, assumption, agenda review. Um, we're going to share some research. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about barriers and strategies. We're going to move into a, a panel conversation with some amazing folks. With some amazing folks. Um, we're going to do a little bit of small group work, although, um, oh, look at that time. We're evidently going to go back in time to do that small group work. Um, yes, time, time machine is going to be very effective for having a diverse board. Um, so uh, we may shift that a little bit just based on uh, some energy in the room, but we'll play that as it lays. Um, we're going to have some report outs and open discussion, and then we'll have some closing thoughts. Um, so we're going to present some TCG board research. You'll see uh, occasional pictures from TCG, uh, TCG's fall forum. There's no hidden meaning in these pictures. It's just sometimes slides are boring without pictures of people. So um, next, next slide. OK, a little bit about the research. Primarily, it's from this study, uh, 116 TCG member theaters. These theaters um, tended to be a little bit larger um, and tended to be a little bit older than the full diversity of TCG's membership. We're also going to talk about some trends um, from, the, from the three times that we have done this governing board's survey. Um, so just so when we talk about these different budget groups, this is what we mean by budget group one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, interesting to note is the different ages of these theaters that uh, the largest are, uh, the, the two largest are the oldest, which is not surprising. Um, and the average number of trustees goes up the larger the theater is. Also probably not surprising, um, but what will be interesting is to note that um, just because you have more trustees doesn't necessarily mean your board is more 
racially diverse. So we'll come back to that. Uh, next slide. Um, we're going to be referencing a couple other uh, points of TCG research, things like theater facts, things like our game-changing governance survey. We're also going to be drawing on experience from various fall forum and conference programming. Uh, in this space later, there's going to be an awesome session on board engagement that's going to be led by some folks in this room. So if you want to continue the board conversation, this is where it's at. And we're going to be drawing from some of the amazing work they've been doing too. That's just a little context. Um, so yes, more pictures of people, including one of our panelists. Keep going. <laughs> Looking very handsome, I will say. <laughs> um, so here's some good news. In terms of gender parity, our, our boards are, are pretty equitable. Um, and, and they're more equitable, in fact, than our staff leadership. Um, the, the theater field is actually ahead of the uh, not-for-profit field more generally, and way ahead of the for-profit field, which is super dude dominated. Um, but we do want to note that we are not just operating in a gender binary, and that there's still a lot of work in terms of trans and gender non-conforming folks on board. Boards, um, there were none, no, no folks who identified as trans or gender queer when we last did this survey. So we are not patting ourselves on the back too hard in terms of uh, gender parity in that regard. Um, okay, ooh, oh, sorry. you, we really need to go back to that slide. Okay, <laughs> um, so here's where we're doing a little less well. I uh, just want to acknowledge that when this survey was done, this is some of the language we were doing. Our language around race and ethnicity has changed a little bit since then, but we're not gonna dwell on it. Um, so as you can see, uh, our, our theater boards are predominantly white. And uh, they, get, they get a little bit more white as uh, the size of the theater grows. Um, it's really just budget group one where we're, we're seeing any sort of significant headway. Um, and we see that uh, there are some areas of racial and ethnic identity that are really significantly underrepresented in our boards. Okay? And there are some reasons for that. Uh, we're seeing longer terms and older trustees at our theaters. Uh, in 2004, 26% of trustees were 60 years or older. That's 42% now in 2013. Wow. Yeah, in, in 2013, 76% of trustees were 50 years or older. Only 6% were younger than 40, right? Wow. 41% um, of theaters impose limits on consecutive years, but the average trustee serves seven consecutive years, and almost every single theater allows them to come back. Um, it's like, and you know, there's yeah. there's reasons for that, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Yeah. There's reasons for yeah. that, right? Yeah. And and the reasons uh, have to do with actually a success story. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the recession hit theaters really hard, and one of the most significant things that led to recovery and any sort of sustainability was trustees. Trustee giving really jumped over the recession, so it is not surprising that theaters would have held on to board members that had the capacity <coughs> and the commitment to support, theater, uh, to support the theaters during those times, right? So this is a success story, but it's also problematic, okay? And it speaks to priorities. So let's move to the next slide. This is from uh, the Game Changing Governance Survey, wanting to acknowledge that in terms of priorities for both staff and trustees, fundraising and giving gets number one priority. Not surprising, right? Um, here's where we begin to see equity, diversity, and inclusion. It is further down, further down here. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about give and gets. Most theaters have either a give and get or uh, a give and get. Um, those tend to be pretty large. Uh, but boards tend to give at at least the minimum or more. It's very rare that folks give no gift at all. Let's take a little closer look at how that plays out. So we're looking at the smallest theater to the largest theater. Um, what's really interesting is that this huge jump from five to six is pretty consistent over a couple of years. Um, but you can see that if, if there's any sort of perception that um, there's a tension between a commitment to racial diversity and a need to have uh, donors giving and getting at a high level, that could be, con that perception could be contributing to that difference between budget group one all the way down in terms of having achieved it. Individual trustee or donor um, gift? Average per individual per trustee gift. Per budget yeah, group. Per budget group. Um, so let's uh, move to the next. Um, and again, so perhaps not surprising when we ask what priorities are, access to wealth being uh, the primary one. And here's that statistic again. Over the past five years, trustee giving rose 33%, right? So again, we're talking about a success story that also has significant consequences. Uh, so let's move to the next slide. Okay, barriers and strategies. 
Um, so now we're going to talk about when we've done this work and we've had these conversations, we've noticed some things that get uh, mentioned again and again as barriers to achieving uh, a racially diverse and inclusive board. So we're going to talk about those a little bit, but it's sort of just to set the table for the panel conversation. So I'm going to move through this kind of quickly. Um, and I'm doing all right you do on time. doing really well with the time. That's great. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so, so bear in mind, things are going to pop for you. Write them down. Note them. We're going to have a chance to process them. But this is just to sort of lay some of the assumptions, maybe even myths, that we've heard about uh, perceived barriers, and then maybe some strategies to address them. Uh, so can we go to the first? This is the biggest one, right? That, that the give and get, that the need for, um, for, us to, for us to have boards who can give at a certain level is the biggest barrier. Uh, it's sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, when it gets discussed, it's discussed in very fraught ways, right? And I have no doubt that that plays out at all of your boards as well. Um, but there's some problems with this, this assumption. Um, and there's some strategies to address it. We're going to look at personal strategies, organizational strategies, field-wide and beyond. Personal, we all need to sharpen our analysis of racism and capitalism. Uh, yes, we're going there. We're talking about capitalism. Um, the first is the idea that there are not potential trustees of color who can give at these levels is just flat out wrong, right? That is, that is not true. And the assumption that when there's, there's a trustee of color who maybe doesn't give at a certain level, that that's because they don't have that money, might also be flawed. It might also be a different dynamic that is operating on your board. And in order to understand those dynamics, really the only way to do that is we have to take on an analysis of how racism operates in our culture and how capitalism operates in our culture. And that's, that's an, a, an acknowledgement that yes, there are trustees of color who are out there who can give at those levels, and it is also true that communities of color have been systemically exploited and plundered through segregation, through redlining. I mean, we could have a whole session about this, right? And that is also true, okay? And we need to bring that analysis to bear when we are thinking about strategies on how to bring on more trustees of color. Organizationally, we need to equalize diversity and give and get as priorities, at least equalize them, if not maybe put that diversity, that racial justice as a higher priority because we know what we're up against in terms of systemic racism, right? If there is not that organizational commitment, it's just gonna be really hard to make any sort of lasting gain. And we'll hear that from our panelists. Field-wide, this is not about blaming one theater, this is not about blaming one community, this is not about blame at all. We are all trapped in this system where after this recession happened, of course we had to reach out to trustees who had the capacity to give. So without a field-wide conversation about give-get policies, term limits, diversity, all this stuff, you know, we're going to be operating in isolation and it's going to be harder to make real change. Work to end systemic racism. Yes, this is bigger than just the theater field. <coughs> the idea that the theater field is going to have super racially diverse boards without anything changing in our broader culture is it's just not going to happen, right? Because what is happening in communities of color is state violence, right? Is school to prison pipeline. I mean, like there is serious existential issues affecting communities of color and to pretend that like their number one priority should be joining our theater's board <laughs> right like we're just not operating in a place of any honesty if that's if that's where the conversation starts so we have always got to be thinking about this as we're also thinking about cultivating trustees of color <laughs> next uh, oh yeah uh, I think we skipped over cultivation. Um, great um, so cultivation, this is often listed as a big thing. How do I begin this conversation? How do I continue it? And we're going to hear some of that uh, 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 from our panelists. Uh, a huge thing is to address your own personal unconscious bias. I got it, you got it, we all got it. It's real, there's no way around it. We can pretend it's not there, but that doesn't help anybody, right? So it's just beginning to realize the ways in which we are constantly making judgments about all of our trustees, including potential trustees of color, that they are reading and making judgments about whether or not it's going to be a safe space when they come into your board, right? So if you're not taking that time, 
you're going to have a lot of trouble. Um, organizationally, you need to signal a commitment to diversity, to racial equity, through the language you use, through your, through your mission, through your values, through your programming. You know, folks are going to be looking at the plays that you're doing, the educational work that you're doing, through your staffing. You know, it's possible if your board is, is mostly, or if your staff is mostly or all white, to, to create board diversity, but it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard. Um, Field-wide, championing theaters of color. Okay, so when we're talking about cultivating trustees of color, there's folks who've been doing that for generations. They're theaters of color. They know how to do it, right? And so we need to celebrate that wisdom and that knowledge, and we need to position theaters of color as leaders they are in that work, um, and not and not then you know try to try to in our efforts to diversify our board undermine that knowledge and that expertise. You'll note that this is the same again. <laughs> Work to end systemic racism. There's going to be a theme for that beyond. Can we move on to the next? Um, oh yeah, there it is again. Okay, so um, tokenism. When you, when you have uh, trustees of color on your board, there is often going to be a feeling of tokenism. Either, oh, we're worried they're going to feel that way, so how do we, or, or they're going to feel that way, right? Um, and a big thing is developing facilitation skills, right? There are going to be people on your board who are not going to have the same analysis of racial power dynamics as you, as we all do in this room, um, <laughs> and, and, and as we don't in this room, right? So it's really important to develop facilitation skills, because if you can't manage those dynamics in the room, you're going to be exposing those folks to an unsafe space, and that's just nasty. We don't want that, right? And there are some wonderful organizations that do that. Um, we try to do that at the Institute. Carmen Morgan and Art Equity is an, an amazing organization that develops facilitators and facilitation skills. So there's <coughs> folks out there doing this work if you want to go and find those skills. Um, organizationally, creating a culture of inclusion where everyone takes responsibility for this work. When uh, trustees of color are in charge of it, <laughs> that's super problematic, right? They should be able to show up as who they are and know that they're going to have allies on the board in diversifying the board and creating a culture of inclusion and in moving towards racial equity. <coughs> Field-wide, it's important to support cohorts of theater that are committed to board diversity. That's what we're trying to do with the Institute. You can't do it alone. It's really hard. It's exhausting. Um, and to acknowledge that there may want to be affinity space for trustees of color. Right? That, that affinity space is a great tool, as, uh, for those of you who were at How We Show Up yesterday, that Carmen talked about, for folks to work through the power dynamics that they might be encountering <coughs> on your boards with people who are going through the same thing, and to celebrate that conversation, to honor it as essential for the work moving forward. We already talked about that one. Okay, so next slide. Whew, I get to stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, Gus, for that. Uh, <laughs> get an overview with slides, we also want to acknowledge, I just want to lift up something that Gus said, uh, we are not content experts. Um, I'm standing here also as a person of color, and I will flat out say that I am not a content expert on these issues. The whole point, especially in gathering these <coughs> kinds of situations, is to really share knowledge. You know, it's all about resource sharing. And we want to hear directly from folks who have had examples of, of strategies and models that worked for them. So today we have uh, an awesome foursome uh, here. Okay. Awesome foursome. Awesome foursome. Um, we have Adrian awesome. Hudu, Managing Director of Theater Offensive. Thank you. You want to raise your hand? Just give a little hey. Hi, everyone. Um, Marshall Jones, Producing Artistic Director, Crossroads Theater Company. Hi. Awesome Platt, Executive Artistic Director of Dallas Children's Theater. Hi. Dave Rybeck, Producing Artistic Director of the Theater Offensive. Thank you. So we're just going to take um, the next few moments to kind of hear directly from some of these folks that can share some similarities, differences on approaching some of these issues. So why don't we start with Abe? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. Can you hear me back there? <clears throat> yes? Okay. Tell me if I go soft on you, okay? Guys do that all the time. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm a, it's on tape. 10, 10 oh. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, 
<laughs> I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> so we're a queer theater company called the Theater Offensive. Deal with it. Um, we're in Boston, and um, we started in 1989, and our board of directors at the very beginning were collaborators that who were, we were working with locally. And we chose from our collaborators to make sure that we had good representation of the folks in the community that we were intending to work with and serve well. And so from the beginning of the theater offensive, we actually had a majority people of color on our board. Um, that came and went over the years. Um, and also as we grew, we started to have to look more at, well, are we getting the skills that we need? Not just the um, viewpoints that we needed, but what are we, do we have the skills that we need on the board? Do we have a, you know, a lawyer, a finance person, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker? And um, that uh, added a level of complication that made it, um, we had to be more intentional about making sure that we were, we were staying racially diverse as we were seeking out our lawyers and, and accountants. Um, I want to fast forward to our 20th anniversary. In, um, it was approaching in 2009. Great timing, right? We're looking at the world and we're saying queer theater, uh, you know, we were doing queer theater in the south end of Boston at the, uh, at the Boston Center for the Arts. And, you know, when we started out, that was really unusual and in that building, it was really rare. But 20 years later, you could say, we had done a great job of it. It was actually quite common. There were even sister companies of ours, who I love, who are right here in the room, doing it regularly along with us. And we really thought like, and yet in other places in Boston, in the neighborhoods where we're trying to draw people into the Boston Center for the Arts, you not only can't see a queer show there, you can't see any show at all in many parts of these neighborhoods. In fact, a kid in one of our youth troop uh, improv sessions said, why do I have to take two trains and a bus just to be who I really am? I want to be out in my own neighborhood. Out in your neighborhood became the theme of our work. We stopped being a resident theater company at the Boston Center for the Arts and refocused all of our work into four specific neighborhoods of Boston, uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, the South End, and Jamaica Plain. Along with that, we also started to really look at our core documents. And this is what I want to bring up with you. It was really important that we sifted through our mission and our vision and our strategic plan to make sure that these core documents really um, made explicit our anti-racist work, which we had been doing all along to some extent. But uh, you know, it was really important that we say, for instance, we believe, which we do in these neighborhoods, that to overcome homophobia, the intersectionality that they were talking about before, we can't succeed at overcoming uh, homophobia in Roxbury unless we're also tackling racism. It's essential to our stated goal. That really helped in terms of recruiting and sustaining board enthusiasm from the, the diverse communities that we were serving. Because they could say like, yeah, not only am I pouring myself into this, but these white people on this board too are making a commitment to this. They're showing allegiance to this, and I can expect them to be held accountable to doing the work. When an issue of racism comes up at the theater offensive, it's not the black people on the board's job to talk about it, right? That's going to be really important in having a diverse board. How am I doing on time? You're good. I have a minute and a half for you. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I want to say, make a couple other points here. Um, as we switched from and it was around that same time of when we switched kind of our, our strategy that we also switched the way the board was organized 
to be more of a governing board. It wasn't just representation and just skills. It was now, they were really taking on governance of the organization in a more serious way. So we as the staff were, were accountable to the board in a way that we hadn't really stepped up to before. This also meant that the board was accountable to itself and it built in really dynamite management systems, self-management systems, um, a really rigorous annual self-evaluation, and then an annual retreat that was focused on taking the results of that evaluation and putting needed changes into practice. Everybody's on board for that. These, super, these were super helpful in recruiting and retaining all board members, but especially making sure that people of color, trans people, more women were felt feeling welcome on our board because there were systems where they knew their board, their voices were going to be powerful and heard and make a difference. Um, I will go back to say a couple more seconds to just say the first thing I said. Oh, by the way, we have straight members on our board too. Diversity. <laughs> and. Um, and I, I wa just want to mention these things about the trans folks on the boards. So important. And uh, most even LGBT companies don't have trans folks on their boards. And uh, we do, and it makes a big difference. <coughs> Lastly, this thing of having challenging racism be real in your organization, represented in your staffing systems, and in your core documents is a way that people can know that if they get involved, they can say, when they're encountering racism in your organization, they are empowered to say, look, this isn't me complaining. This is you saying what you want to do in the organization, live up to it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. a little bit on the leadership shown by individuals of color in opening doors and also building connections. Hi. Um, well, started Dallas Children's Theater back in 1984 with all of $500. But what I did have was a wonderful group of friends and associates um, in the artistic world. And uh, so actually we started our board with some really strong people uh, from of diversity. Uh, in Wake and Dallas. Uh, Margie Reese, who's administrator or director, um, uh, Yoichi Aoki, a wonderful designer, uh, producer, uh, connected us to a lot of wonderful Asian work. Cecilia Flores, who had already done a lot of bilingual translations for us and work I've been doing in the parks. Uh, Juan Flores, who uh, was a, a superintendent DISD in charge of desegregation. And um, then Preston Tachawika, um, he was uh, a, a Comanche and helped us with a, a production of uh, 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 Indian uh, legends. And uh, then we had uh, some elderly people, Eva Hawley, Jeanette Early, and uh, also an elderly person connected us with the Hunt Association, Hunt family. Uh, Caroline Rose Hunt, whose daughter became uh, one of our board presidents. So we started, uh, now that I'm looking back, it looks like we had a pretty powerful uh, kind of out, the, out of the uh, gate, although, uh, but at the time it was very difficult. <laughs> I didn't have a salary, for instance, for several years. Uh, I figured out my first budget. Uh, and said, well, you need a budget. So I wrote up a budget and I uh, figured I needed $400,000. Well, that first year we earned 40,000 and had 40,000 contributed. And somebody said, well, this is a celebration. I thought it was dreadful, but <laughs> I thought I'd been a huge failure. But we did gradually build on that. And some of these people were totally instrumental, as well as a man named Rocky Howard, who um, was with Merrill Lynch and helped us a lot in the financial area. So um, just keep, he was our treasurer for about seven or eight years. So he was just, uh, great friend and is still on our emeritus board so we've been able to hold on to him uh, <clears throat> but I think uh, number one it was you know somebody said to me before I really got, well, I was thinking about starting the theater he said well who do you know and I think that is I just every day I still say to myself 
who do I know or who do I know who knows who, or who do the people I'm working with, who do you know? So people, give to people, people like to work with people, uh, community, it's going back to community. Um, and I think for us it also goes back to the work. Um, so, so much of the time that we've been able to recruit exciting, dynamic people uh, of, of color, it's been because of work that we were doing. And of course, we do perform to every zip code in the city of Dallas uh, for, through student matinees. Uh, the combination of our student matinees and our weekend uh, public performances. So uh, our budget at, has grown from that <coughs> startup of, of uh, $500 to the, around the range of $4 million, and we serve about 250,000 people a year, including about 100,000 of those <coughs> for our national tour that goes out coast to coast. So uh, we have grown a lot. Um, well, I'm just going to take one example uh, of a show that we were uh, excited about working on. Uh, I helped develop the show uh, with Katamiya. We did some workshops and then um, I really didn't think that we would produce it, but then we got really excited about it after we did a, a reading of it and it said, oh, this must go in our season. So I'm looking toward developing uh, having Mariachi Girl. And we were doing a, a reading and I was bringing together a bunch of the artists and I thought, aha, uh -huh, what we really need to do here is um, maybe have a little bit of a, um, of, a, of a luncheon. And several of my board members jumped on the board, including Mickey Bragalone, who's standing right here. And uh, she, uh, they, we did a luncheon. And the luncheon was wonderful. We had uh, all of the members of the cast, because I, I cast it at that time, and all of the artistic team, and I split them up so that each table had an artistic person, and then we had guests that came. Well, one of our board members, uh, Courtney Perez, had brought uh, a, a woman named Beatrice Martinez, and she was very impressed. Everybody, it was a wonderful, upbeat, joyful kind of event. It was just a celebration. Uh, so several months later, we uh, actually opened the show, and again, Mickey Bragalon had a uh, opening night dinner. Um, I didn't know she was going to be here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> opening night dinner uh, before the show, and uh, this Beatrice uh, uh, Courtney, invite, who was on the board, invited Beatrice Martinez to come. So I'm going over to the table to say hello and, and you know visit with her and thank her for coming. And uh, this is Beatrice, and I turn to her husband, and he says, well, Robin, I worked with your father developing uh, the Booker T. Washington High School for the Visual and Performing Arts. And um, that was a great experience, and anything you need, you just let me know, and I'm going to help you. I mean, my gosh, it, this was 20 years, I mean, years later. I didn't even know this. And here he is right there sitting in my own theater. So I uh, waited just a few minutes and then said, well, what I really need is for you to join my board. And he turns to Beatrice and says, how about you joining the board? And she did, and she is on our board. And she has been instrumental in helping us meet so many initiatives. For instance, we have a big fight with our school board, uh, not school, uh, the school administration, because gradually they have, they are spending more and more time developing the contracts and the uh, order numbers that go to the teachers that allow them to book kids to come to our shows. So now the entire fall semester, we don't have any DISD students in our, perform our, our student matinees. Well, this is a travesty, and I, it, you know, it's just I took on this mission. I'm going to practice somehow. Well, we cracked it with Beatrice Martinez because she brought to our gala two of the top people in DISD who were going to become the top people in DISD. And now through Beatrice and those two people, we have a contract with the district, a direct contract. We've never had a direct contract with them for uh, school students. So the entire second grade will come to our performances as of this fall, starting in the middle of September, not in January. <laughs> so that is a huge, huge uh, <coughs> movement. I mean, to move that district is just almost impossible. And so she made that difference. She also had helped us get uh, increase in funding from the city of Dallas through the council, city council. We have 
first we got 2% of our budget from the city. We've now gotten a big 4%, which is huge uh, growth. Uh, the cap, of course, is 25%. Uh, we'll never get to that. But <laughs> anyway, um, and then the other thing that she's helped us with uh, uh, in enormously is she takes great interest in the development of our projects, of our upcoming plays. We have a uh, play in progress uh, uh, program now, and she's come where a play is being in development. We bring in visitors, anybody that's open to anybody to come. And she comes and is, takes a really active part in that. Uh, as we're working with something like Tomas and the Library Lady, which is a known <coughs> script by Jose Cruz Gonzalez and by the Legend of the Blue Bonnet that we're developing with the Guajil Tecans, who were the original indigenous, indigenous people of Texas, uh, along with uh, Roxanne Schroeder Arce uh, as a playwright and uh, uh, Lorenzo Garcia, I mean, uh, 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 Caramilla helping us with that. So. Um, it's just invaluable having people that can help with the programming, help with the cultures, uh, help us be authentic, and uh, really move us forward in so many wonderful ways. And I'm sure I'm almost over. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> now we are going to hear from Adrian Boudou talking about having full <coughs> board commitment in maintaining board culture as well, amongst other things. Great. First, uh, thank you. I want to lift up uh, that I am not an expert at this. Um, we live in a diverse, multicultural environment. And what's important to understand, it's about human connection. And it's about growth and building community and learning from each other that can make us better and make purposeful decisions around diverse boards. I will speak to you today as a managing leader, as the chief fundraiser, chief marketer, and my experience as a person of color on, on a board and other committees. Um, first, uh, you know, as a managing leader, um, an all-white staff cannot sustain a diverse board. That's the reality of it. Um, if you can, it's very difficult. Um, it's important to, uh, the impact on staff, it's important to have a diverse board because the board can make decisions that benefits people of color and staff. If you have an all-white board with a, with a diverse staff, how are those decisions being made? How are conversations around pipeline for people of color in leadership positions being talked about? How are board members holding directors and senior leaders in organizations accountable and responsible for having that pipeline? So it's very important that the board is very diverse, the staff is very diverse. They need to work in synchronicity. As a, uh, as a fundraiser, um, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all model for fundraising the communities of color. <coughs> and it's important that to recognize that there are cultural differences when asking for money. Um, there are cultural differences when asking a white person for money, an Indian person for money, a black person, an Asian person. So uh, it's your responsibility to figure that out, um, quite frankly. <laughs> you know, um, sorry, brain is going a million miles an hour. Um, yes, oh yeah, and board members are investors. Donors are investors. When you get in front of investors, and investors could be someone who's given $500, but they're really committed to your work. They want to advocate for you. They're there. You're expanding your family. They're asking questions. I mean, people are savvy. People are guarded with their money. They want to know if they're investing their money in organizations. It's, there's impact. And in, our, in my experience, folks are asking, how diverse is your board? Is there a trans person on your board? You're saying you're working in communities of color, queer communities of color, where there's a, heavy, uh, a low income population. What is the staff structure like? What is the board structures, uh, structure like? And you need to answer those questions because that will make or break people invested <coughs> in your work and believing in your program. Um, and third, I want to talk about, as a marketer, 
this is really good when your boards are diverse. It's just really good because you get to communicate the impact that it has not only on staff, but also in the community. Communities want to see their boards reflect them. And it's, it's just a, a great piece of thing to have in your pocket when you're going out and meeting folks and building connections. To honestly say, we serve the community, and as an or organization, we are morally obligated to have a board and staff reflective of the communities we serve. And finally, my experience as a board member, um, as a person of color. It's important that people, white people, at the table with people of color who are on boards know when to step up and step back and allow different perspectives. Oftentimes, I'm in rooms, at board meetings, at, in cohorts where people are so committed to the cause of equity, diversity, and inclusion, but yet, the majority of voices are white people. So step back and allow others to speak. And understand that privilege, it is a privilege, and if you cannot recognize that, that's also a privilege. So I say, um, um, be aware of that. As I mentioned before, I'm not an expert, but what I can tell you, it's a human connection that will make us better. Thanks. Thank you. We have Marshall Jones here. Thank you. Wow. As a producer, I love sold out houses, so this, <laughs> this is great. Um, I'm going to call an audible for those football fans. Um, uh, I want to talk about mission and the importance of mission, but after seeing Gus and his great presentation, just very well succinct, very well put out, I think it would be helpful if you guys could see the trajectory of the board of the Crossroads Theater Company. Crossroads Theater Company is an African-American theater company in New Brunswick, New Jersey, started in 1978 by Ricardo Kahn and Lee Richardson. So think about the world in the mid-70s. Roots just happened. Not the one we just saw, but <laughs> the original. Uh, the first Roots came on, but there was no cable, so there was no BET. There was no Bill Cosby. There was no uh, 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 major source for black people to see people that look like them. 1976, Ricardo and Lee graduated. They were the first graduating class of the Mason Grove School of the Arts at Rutgers University, and they were ready to take on the world. But they didn't sing, and they did not want to play drug dealers. No disrespect to Antonio Vargas, Starsky and Hutch, those of you old enough to remember that. They didn't want that role. They didn't want those jobs and they didn't sing. So after only being out in the world for one year, they said, you know, we got to do our own. We have got to start our own theater company. Hence, in 1978, they started the Crossroads Theater Company. I think the important thing to recognize why that theater company was so successful early on in those years is that there was total buy-in. There was another theater called the George Street Playhouse in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and they said, sure, come on. Uh, Eric Krebs was willing to, to uh, uh, sponsor Crossroads. Um, Johnson & Johnson Worldwide Headquarters is in New Brunswick. They gave lots of support. Uh, uh, Merck, Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. So the, the white power structure joined the board and said this was a very, very good thing. In 1991, a brand new building was built for Crossroads. Brand new building, uh, right next to the George Street Playhouse, which was no longer on George Street. It was on Livingston <laughs> Avenue. They didn't change the name to Livingston Avenue Playhouse. It's still the George Street Playhouse. Um, uh, but it was a brand new building built right there for, uh, for Rick after being around for only 12 years. They gave him the keys and they said, here. This was a 5,000 square foot facility. There was a small little one, uh, 100, 100 seat facility. This was 300 rehearsal studios, four flights. If you've ever run a major theater, maintaining the space is a job within itself. <laughs> um, the, the economy shifted. There was a, a, a recession in 92. <coughs> Bill Clinton got elected. Remember, it's the economy, stupid. Um, so there was a shift 
the Cosby Show was the number one show. Uh, 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 so the, the, there were societal shifts, um, and Crossroads was able to still maintain this high level of success, but running that facility weighed it down. In 1999, Crossroads was the first African American theater company to win the Tony Award for Outstanding Regional Theater. Award for Outstanding Regional Theater. Thank you. But guess what happened in 2000? The building closed. How did that happen? You know, how did the board let that happen? Those are the hard questions we have to ask ourselves. And the reason, guys, is because the work on stage was so spectacular. But maintaining this building was an albatross, and it wasn't dealt with. So winning the Tony was great on one hand. It got all this notoriety. But by the other hand, it's like, oh, there's a $2 million debt. So the state of New Jersey was willing to give Crossroads some money. But they wanted the board to resign. And the board said, sure, anything for Crossroads, because they believe, they believe in our mission. And that's really key to getting a diversified board, getting any board member, is to have them believe in your mission. So hmm, uh, a committee was formed, and a large um, uh, uh, a new board was brought in of business leaders, people who did not necessarily understand the mission, understand nonprofit organizations, have an understanding of what Crossroads means to the community. They looked at the numbers and they said, whoa, this is not sustainable. And what did they do? They shut it down. <coughs> they shut it down, guys. They shut it down because the board, the people that led Crossroads at that time, in 2000, 2001, did not have a connection to the mission, did not understand that, of course, a not-for-profit organization is not sustainable. That's why it's called <laughs> not-for-profit. <laughs> I'm going to segue for one second and, and, and give some props to uh, D uh, David Grant, who is a former executive director of the Dodge Foundation. Uh, he lives in Vermont now. I told him if Bernie got to the White House, he really has to share this idea. He says we should not be called not-for-profits. He says we should be called social profits mm -hmm. because we provide mm -hmm. capital and assets mm -hmm. to society. But those business leaders in 2000 did not understand the social profit that an organization putting on shows about a, a, a rich culture of this country has value. So they shut it down. Fortunately, um, after the theater was closed for two years, there was a retired dean. He just retired. And he was pained. He was pained by driving past, seeing that building dark. And he rolled up his sleeves. And he single-handedly got that $2 million worth of debt down to a couple hundred thousand. His name is Richard Nurse. And we owe him a great, great deal of gratitude. Um, so, uh, I came on the Crossroads in 2007. You guys know what happened in 2008? <laughs> <laughs> Great timing! Um, but, um, we survived, you know? And on the one hand, it's surprising, but on the other hand, it's not. Because we, as a people, have survived in this country for over 300 years against Massive, massive odds. So on the one hand, I'm not surprised that we, we were able to get through. It was really, really tough. Tough, tough, tough. Because we did not have the types of, of board members who could write those checks to uh, get us through. So how do we find a board member? Okay, Because we need to diversify our board. We have uh, 13 people. Only two are white. I think the best, per best way of finding a board member is to look in your audience. Mm -hmm. Are they coming to your shows? The white people on our board come to our shows. We have several white people who are part of our, our, our membership, and I love asking them why you come. And they all pretty much say the same thing. They learn something. 
each and every time they come to see a show at Crossroads, they learn something. They learn something about themselves. They learn something about their neighbors. They learn something about uh, a culture that there's a, a high degree of curiosity. So um, I would encourage you all, if you want to find board members, you look in your audience. But then if you say, oh my gosh, there are no black people, there are no Chinese people, there are no Asian people in my audience, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You can't assume <coughs> that you know, they want to see your shows. I've never seen Friends. <laughs> I saw it. Oh, that was funny, but OK. <laughs> I have no desire to see friends. I don't see anybody that looks like me. They don't talk like me. That's not me. Um, so I think you have to ask yourselves, well, programmatically, and not just February, by the way. Mm -hmm. Not oh, just yeah. February. I, I appreciate my colleagues at Two River. You, you're doing August and October. In September. September. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, that's where you start. You start with your pro, uh, program. And then if you then, but you can't just, it's not just a quick fix. It's not just like, okay, we'll, we'll do this August Wilson, and then we'll diversify our boards. It's not gonna happen that way. Um, you know, Gus laid it out. He did a great job laying it out. Yeah. So that's my story. Thank you very much. <laughs>
breakouts in like two or three and just talk about immediate things that you'd like to respond to, you know, something that you learned, um, something you think that you can apply to your own organization. So we are going to take the next five minutes to do that in twos and threes, okay? <laughs>
They're not going to end, they're just now going to be with everyone. Um, so so uh, what we're going to do now is uh, really anyone who wants to raise a hand, share an observation, ask a question. It could be of our amazing panelists. It can be to the room. This is in the space where we're all kind of in it together trying to figure this out. Paul. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thanks to the panel. And I've been participating in the cohort uh, that TCG organized at the Diversity, Equity, and Food Institute. And so all the panelists, I just want to say, I can't encourage people enough to consider participating in that. Because there's a level ex of expertise, and there's a depth of discussion. And there's also encountering discomfort, um, unease with uh, certain aspects of it. White fragility is a word that I didn't know about until I participated in this institute. But I just want to raise uh, something that Adrian said, which I thought is very specific to my theater, Ensemble Studio Theater in New York City. Uh, we're a very well established, overwhelmingly white institution. It's a huge ensemble of over 600 artists. Uh, I'm executive director. And uh, one of the things I learned just on Wednesday uh, at DEI was some of the concrete examples that other theaters are using. In particular, I was thinking Dallas Theater Center and the Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago um, for how to really commit to uh, this idea of diversity, equity, inclusion, in particular, when Adrian said, you know, if the staff is, you know, not diverse, it's very hard to support board members coming in because you're not sort of necessarily seeing the values put in place. And I think, you know, I've advocated for a statement of values for our theater to be incorporated into our strategic planning. We actually haven't done that. And I think it actually matters a great deal. And I wanted to say that one of the examples that was brought up, and I think it was Dallas Theater Center, had to do with giving staff members the sort of idea that you have to include diversity, equity, inclusion goals in your work plan for the year. And then in the performance evaluations to ask, you know, how did it go this year? How did you do personally in putting forward and advocating for these values in our theater in your work? I mean, in our own theater company, uh, in our, uh, we've started paying interns for the first time because internships become one of the just early ways to establish career um, connections. And uh, by not paying people, in a sense, we only made it possible for people who can afford to intern in our theater. And so, you know, I was very proud that we started paying interns. Then uh, we started talking about apprenticeships. And, um, you know, I just found that um, we have a very charismatic person in our theater who teaches at an actually majority white college. And suddenly, uh, we have these apprentices who are all white who are right in line for the first job openings in our theater right now. And I keep bringing it up. I brought it up in board meetings. And um, I'm very concerned about it, because I feel that we just adopted a five-year strategic plan. And diversity, equity, inclusion is one of the four pillars in the plan. But in fact, the first job openings are only going to be available to these wonderful, wonderful young people whom we love who are in our midst. But I keep saying, you know. We're, we're, not, we're denying opportunity to other young people whom we will absolutely fall in love with because of their professionalism, their smarts, their dedication to theater, what they help us learn about. 
if we're not creating equity of access to job opportunities in our theater. So I just wanted to just comment on what Adrian said and also just comment on practical examples that theaters are uh, incorporating into their very specific individual work plans. And then to also say paying interns is really a, a way to start, but also making sure that you have alliances with sources of uh, uh, very professional training uh, grounds for young people to come into your theaters and to know that you're, you're being fair in creating uh, open access to job opportunities that are going to come up. Uh, thanks, Paul. And I just um, I want to reply to that and also just acknowledge that we only have 16 minutes left. <laughs> I'm sorry. No. <laughs> not to apologize. That, that's just, just so that we're all aware because we might not be. Um, so that's the time that we have left for all the great questions. And, and the only thing I, I want to see if anyone wants to respond to that, but want to acknowledge that um, one of the things that TCG has been going through is examining a, a document that's called the Culture of White Supremacy. And what's fascinating about this document is that it, 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 it explores behavior that you wouldn't normally think of as racist. But it is racist and sexist, etc., because it is behavior that perpetuates hierarchies and, uh, and a pace of work where it is impossible to interrupt the thing that you are talking about. It is impossible to say, hold up, how do all our interns become white? Well, of course, I mean, there, there are systems that are designed to, to make that the case, right? And unless you have the capacity to, to slow things up and interrupt it, it's going to keep happening. And so that's been very successful for us. And if people are curious about that document, email me and I will share it. Uh, I think uh, here and then here. Yeah, uh, so Paul, thank you both very much. Uh, I'm on the Dallas Future Board. And, uh, Get actually, here. Sorry? Yes, please stand, stand up, please. Stand as you are able. <laughs> Nobody ever complains about not being able to hear me, so that, that's, that's unusual. I'm usually the loudest guy in the room. So uh, when we, uh, Kevin Moriarty, our artistic director, uh, he is such an advocate for diversity. And he started at the artistic level first and said, we're going to have diversity on our stage. I think that's important. Then he said, we're going to have artistic uh, diversity in our staff. And he managed to do that. And then he said, we're going to have artistic diversity on our board and kind of drag this kicking and screaming into that. And one thing I would just suggest is we established goals, hard goals, because his point was if you establish goals, then you have a way to measure your progress. And, and let me tell you, we did exactly what you said. We checked the box after the first year and said, oh, oh we are racially diverse. And then within two years, we went back down and we no longer actually meet our own stated goals. So we're, we're doing our best to continue to recruit diverse members. It's not easy, but I will say set goals, set specific goals. You will fail to meet them at times, but at least you can look back and measure your progress. <coughs> Thank you. Great to hear the voice of the trustee in this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question. Yeah. Um, so I halfway through writing it down. Can you hear me? No. no. Okay, I'm going to stand up. So this question is for the folks that spoke and also anyone else in the room. My name is Seta. I'm from The Lark in New York. Um, we are in a place right now where we've grown to a point where we are asking our board to take on a more active role in fundraising and recruitment. We're also in a place where we're re revisiting and reevaluating our governance structure. Um, at this point, I would say our kind of equity, diversity, access, and inclusion efforts for staff um, are further developed than that of our board. And um, I'm interested in hearing from organizations um, how you are going about educating your board members um, on equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, things you have in place, resources to go to, um, so that they may also be on board with this, understand the importance of this uh, with us, and help work with us to understand it better as equals in that way. Um, yeah, so if you could just talk about what you have in place, what you're working toward, how that's, how that's working in your organizations. Does anyone want to speak to board education, board training? Oh, oh good. Everyone else is silent. Because I'll do it. Okay. Awesome. Good time. Also, uh, hi, I'm Jamie Plumas from the Alliance Theater. And um, one shift we made in board education this year is um, through the onboarding process, we stopped trying to get as many people in the room at the same time. 
and we started doing one-on-one -on -one orientations where uh, a it's easier to schedule uh, with the Amen. new <laughs> yeah, um, and then B, it really gives them uh, completely dedicated time to ask the questions that they want to ask um, to the people they want to ask them to. And so instead of trying to get the entire senior staff in the room, we uh, ask the new trustee, what part of the theater do you care most about? And, and then they get to spend really dedicated time at the very beginning of their term with the area of the theater that they care about. Uh, and that's helped quite a bit. And I'll just say one other uh, thing. We have had some success in diversifying our board. And uh, I think one area we often overlook that can really help is look for people who have, um, for diversity camps who have kids in schools where theater matters. And, and that's, that's one thing that's really helped us uh, gain several new board members is looking to where uh, diverse children are learning through theater and then they all have parents <laughs> who care about that and we've had some really great success in, in that arena which also you know lowers the average age of our board which is great too. <laughs> I, I, uh, yes and then I might make Gail talk a little bit if, if I can ask you to. Uh, but, yeah hi um, Gail. I have a quick question because I'm, um, I actually have a meeting with a person of color who's being recruited for our board on the 8th of July. This is someone who, came, it came out of a conversation, your board, we need to diversify. Someone said, hey, here's a guy I met at a party. And he fits this and that, and he's young, and I go on our day base, and no, he's never been to a show. He's not. So how do I address this, I have this meeting, I have to go and I address A, fully vetting him, the conversation of what it means to join the board, being prepared for the conversation of, say, tokenism, uh, all these things, and I know this is a question dr directly related to me, and I can justify coming to this conference now when I go back, <laughs> but, uh, but I think this may be, when I first heard you start talking, that stuck into, you know, what pitfalls might I avoid when I start this conversation. I, I think I heard Marshall. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. What theater are you with? I'm with the GAM Theater in Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. What I would suggest, you not do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest you have lunch with this guy and, you know, find, connect with him as an individual. Find out, does he like the Giants? Is he a Yankee fan? Does he have kids? Invite him to your show. Yep. He may hate your shows, <laughs> you know, but, you know, I, I, would, I, I would not bring up board. I, I, you know, what you want to do is you want to establish a relationship. And if that relationship leads to him being a prospective board member, then I think that's great. Like cultivating but, but I think, yeah, yeah. You, you don't, you don't want to just come right out of the box. Hey, hey, here, you are, come join the board. You really want to, you want to respond. Well, I guess, yeah. I just want to yeah. The issue is, and I, and I completely agree with that, and that's the way I would like to go, but the conversation by a board member has already gone to that point. So this, this lunch that's been set up. Has he been to your theater? I do not believe so. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just, you just stretch it out. I mean, this, this stuff, this is, it didn't get this way overnight. It's not going to be microwaved. You know, you, you, you've got to take your time. Excuse me? Wait, wait, I, I don't understand. You know, say, say, look, I know you've been, and this is my gut instinct, is to say, is to say exactly what you're talking about. Yes, you need to come, you need to get to know us, you need to, to be a part of you know, what shows have you seen. Yeah, that's two minutes of your conversation. Right. I would say that's two minutes, and then you want to spend the other hour, or other, can't do math, uh, 58 minutes. I'm a theater guy, okay? Uh, you know, just to, just to connect with them as an individual, as a person. That's going to have much more value than the other stuff. And then say, look, let's revisit in, in two months. You come, you see the show. We'll go out afterwards. You bring your wife. You bring your kids. They come over. We have a good time. You want to connect as on, an, on, on a human level. And if that happens, the board will take care of itself. That's I, I want to, uh, yes, and then I want to build on what Marcia said. One of the things that we never talk about is that you've got to earn the right to engage with the community. And so one of the things that we don't do enough is like we do this individual targeting thing, but 
I think if we would spend more time as a staff, and I'm a trustee, by the way, it, in engaging with the community and in being involved in their organizations, we need to be involved in the Asian Business Association or the Hispanic Business Association, because that's where you meet the people who are the power players. And first, we have to, en to show that we have earned the right to ask for their engagement, mm -hmm. as well as obviously Absolutely. providing programming that's important and relevant and so on. So I just wanted to make that point. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And, and just to lift up a little bit more what I think both you and Marshall are saying is that um, Carmen Morgan, who is uh, the leader of the uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Institute, and so much and connected to so much of TCG's work, um, reminds us that the question is not if racism is at play or if sexism <coughs> is at play. It's how, right? Mm -hmm. It's always at play. It's at play right now in this room, right? Um, so when we are trying to work through that, we really have to treat each other like human beings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we really have to interrupt the kind of pace that turns people into an objective, do you know? Mm -hmm. So I feel like you've been <laughs> positioned in, in a really difficult place by your board. And if you want TCG to you'd be like, TCG said don't do that. You know, use, <laughs> use our institutional power to say that's bad practice. You know, like I'm happy to even follow up there. Like because, because you're being asked to in some ways perpetuate a system which is the exact opposite of the thing you're trying to do, mm -hmm. right? I, I, all I can say is, is like, Yes <laughs> to everything Marshall said. Yes to everything Wendy, Wendy? Wendy said. Um, yeah, I, yes. There was, we, we didn't give an answer uh, to the question that happened before about trainings for boards or how do you make change on the board. And um, one thing that we did when we were very poor was um, we found board members who were attached to our work who had the training skills, who were leaders in this field themselves, and it's something that they could give to the, work, to the board was anti-racism training, but also just as importantly, um, board best practices training. So it was made a big difference when we, you know, white guy came on board who was passionate about equity and diverse, diversity and inclusion, but what he was contributing to that was what are the best practices for self-management on the board. And that ended up being really important, too. Thank you. Gail, yes. So um, I'm Gail Lopes. I'm a trustee at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And um, I'm also on the governance task force. So this is something we're doing a lot of talking about. And we're looking to bring some learnings to you all in making the case for a diverse board to your board educating your board, uh, barriers to a successful recruiting, but also barriers once you get the person on the board and your non-inclusive cultures on the boards. But, so, so lots is going on, but I'm going to disrupt the conversation here as a challenge from Gus. I want you to rethink the give-get requirement. And, um, one way to sort of that I've been that we've been talking about rethinking it is is you don't just say oh, we've got the give get and we're going to make an exception for you over here <laughs> a person of color or or a person in the community um, and it's not it's not about that there aren't people that can give to you that are people of color but there are people of color you want that can't give to you and if you're going to continue to have these give gets with the exceptions on the side, you're not gonna get the equity that you want on your board. So one thought is think about a balanced board. And your balanced board means you have some people over here that are responsible for give, get to the annual fund. And it becomes a time horizon issue. And on the other extreme, you've got long-term financial sustainability of the organization. And to do that, you need to diversify your programming and your audiences. And so now you need people from communities of color uh, that are working for your long-term financial sustainability and how they can bring you new audiences by deeply engaging in their communities, as, as has been said by Wendy and Abe over here, uh, by giving you credibility within their communities so you can even come and talk to them. 
and by understanding their issues so your theater remains vibrant to your community. So that's my, my uh, suggestion about mm -hmm. disrupting. Thank you. And, and, uh, and OSF is a, another institute theater has great board practices. We do need to draw to a close, but I do just want to do two things. Connect uh, what Gail just said to the idea of social uh, profit that I think social you shared, profit, Marshall, yeah. right? Like, what they, if a give right. get was shaped with social profit in mind, right? Yeah. Um, that, that's really excited to like begin this conversation again there. Um, and also just wanted to acknowledge that if you're wondering where Elena went, <laughs> she's okay. Um, she, <laughs> she, um, she's holding down a lot. She's holding down the ground at 20 Arc, uh, an amazing uh, presentation of Beyond Orientalism you're going to see later. So I just want to acknowledge she didn't leave because she didn't like you. <laughs> she, she left because she's leading some amazing work. Um, so we knew right at the beginning we weren't going to have enough time, um, but hopefully these conversations can continue. Uh, and feel free to reach out to me for ways in which TCG can support these conversations at your theaters and board. That's what we're here to do. Thank you so much, everyone.